spiritual traveler through the Bible. Please join me for the next part of my journey through the scriptures. Stay as long as you like and let us together discover a bit more about the Bible. In this podcast, I would like to introduce you to the most infamous character in the whole of scripture, the false Christ of the Great Tribulation, the coming world leader known as Antichrist. By this time, the world is very used to false messiahs. A quick checkup on Wikipedia gave me an up-to-date list of 25 people, three of which have appeared in the last 10 years or so and have featured in the news recently. There is Alan John Miller from Australia, Sergei Torop from Siberia, and Moses Shlongwani who comes from KwaZulu-Natal here in South Africa, all claiming to be the Messiah, Jesus Christ. We shouldn't be surprised at all by these people appearing and making the claims that they do. Jesus himself warned his disciples and us that this would happen. This is what he said in Matthew 24 verses 4 to 5. See that no one leads you astray. For many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ, and they will lead many astray. Our Lord Jesus Christ said many false Christs would come and we should expect that. And we have been warned that these false Christs would lead many people astray. The Bible has a lot to say about these false Christs, and a good place to begin with is the first letter of John, chapter 2, verses 18. Children, it is the last hour, and as you have heard that Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have come. Therefore we know that it is the last hour. John says that we know that this is the last hour because there are many antichrists. We know it is the last hour because the true Christ has come and because his counterfeits are all over the place, trying to lead people astray and away from the real Jesus Christ. Notice in verse 18 John says, Now many antichrists have come. It is important to understand that the concept of antichrist is not limited to one individual. There are many antichrists, and there have been many since the true Christ came. The Greek word used in 1 John is antichristos, and the word anti can mean two things. It means primarily against, so there will be many who will be against Christ. But anti is also used to mean in place of. This means that there will be someone coming and taking the place of Christ, a subtle deceptive impersonation of Jesus Christ. Personally, I think that this use of the word anti describes the character that John is referring to, many antichrists attempting to take the place of Christ in a rather undisguised manner. So John speaks of antichristos, or antichrists, but Jesus uses the Greek word pseudochristos, which means false Christs. Both are against Christ, but subtly they both attempt to take the place of Christ. Alan John Miller says he is the Christ, Sergei Torop says he is the Christ, Moses Shlongwani says he is the Christ. They are just the latest in a long line of these antichrists and false Christ types who have appeared upon the scene. But all of this will culminate in a single final individual. 1 John 2.18 says, You have heard that Antichrist is coming. There will be many false Christs. There will be many who attempt to take the place of Christ, but there will be the final Antichrist, the final false Christ, the final individual who attempts to take the place of Christ and he will be more devastating than any other before him. This final Antichrist is the focus of chapter 13 of Revelation. He has already appeared, in disguise, as the rider on the white horse back in Revelation 6 verses 2. In chapter 12, the Apostle John saw a great red dragon with seven heads, ten horns, and seven crowns, which was clearly identified as a manifestation of Satan. Now in chapter 13, John sees a further manifestation of that same beast. Revelation 13 verses 1 to 4 describes this new manifestation. And I saw a beast rising out of the sea, with ten horns and seven heads, with ten diadems on its horns, and blasphemous names on its heads. And the beast that I saw was like a leopard, its feet were like a bear's, and its mouth was like a lion's mouth, and to it the dragon gave his power and his throne and great authority. One of its heads seemed to have a mortal wound, but its mortal wound was healed, and the whole earth marveled as they followed the beast. 
and they worshipped the dragon, for he had given his authority to the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast, and who can fight against it? John saw this beast rising out of the sea, which, as we have seen several times in Revelation, is a symbol of the Gentile nations of the ancient world. This appearance is another manifestation of Satan as a worldwide evil power on the earth. Back in Revelation chapter 12, I explained that the beast represented the Roman Empire of the first century, who along with Herod the Great was the instrument of the devil to try to destroy the man-child Jesus, who was born to the woman who symbolized Israel. This is the same beast, but arising at a different time of history. Daniel 7 verses 1 to 7 is linked to this chapter 13 of Revelation. Daniel also saw four beasts rising out of the sea. One was like a lion, another like a bear, and the third was like a leopard, with all the same symbols we find used here by John. Along with those first three beasts, Daniel saw a fourth beast, which was powerful but different from the other beasts, with ten horns. So therefore, it was identical with the beast that John saw here in Revelation. As you take the time to read the whole of Daniel 7, you will see later on in the same chapter, Daniel has the vision of the four beasts explained to him. Daniel learned that the beasts he saw represented four great world empires of his day and the following ages. The first was Babylon, which is signified by a lion. Then came Media Persia, which was like a bear. Then Greece appeared, like a leopard with four heads. The strange fourth beast is identifiable in history as the Roman Empire, with its capital in Rome. You might find it very interesting to learn that Alexander's empire was divided amongst four of his generals after his death, and these became separate kingdoms. Cassander ruled in Macedon, Lysimachus in Thrace, Seleucus in Mesopotamia and Persia, and Ptolemy in the Levant and Egypt. John picks up the same symbolism and sees them incorporated in this beast from the sea that appears in his vision in chapter 13 of Revelation. All the characteristics of the first three beasts are combined into one beast. This fourth beast has the lion-like ferocity of Babylon, the crushing bear-like power of Medo-Persia, and the swiftness of the Grecian leopard, but now appears in the last days as a restored form of the Roman Empire, as we shall see. We have already been able to interpret the meaning of the horns, the heads, and the crowns of the dragon, so this beast will be no different. There is a great deal more information that is given to us about this beast in Revelation 17, but we shall not go into much detail of that chapter. But I think it is necessary to point out some of the things that John identifies for us. In chapter 17, John sees a woman sitting upon the red beast. We shall not deal with the woman now, but the red beast on which she sits has seven heads and ten horns. An angel explains to John what these symbols mean in Revelation 17 verses 7, which plainly identifies this beast as the same one we are looking at in chapter 13. Here is the description of the beast from Revelation 17 verses 3 to 12. The angel carried me away in the spirit into a wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was full of blasphemous names, and it had seven heads and ten horns. And the angel said to me, Why do you marvel? I will tell you the mystery of the woman, and of the beast with the seven heads and ten horns that carries her. The beast that you saw was, and is not, and is about to rise from the bottomless pit and go to destruction. And the dwellers on earth whose names have not been written in the book of life from the foundation of the world will marvel to see the beast, because it was, and is not, and is to come. This calls for a mind with wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman is seated. They are also seven kings, five of whom have fallen. One is, and the other has not yet come, and when he does come, he must remain only a little while. As for the beast that was and is not, it is an eighth, but it belongs to the seven, and it goes to destruction. And the ten horns that you see are ten kings who have not yet received royal power, but they are to receive authority as kings for one hour, together with the beast. In chapter 17, the phrase, the beast that was, and is not, and is to come, seems to tie in with what we read in chapter 13, verses 3. 
One of its heads seemed to have a mortal wound, but his mortal wound was healed. If this beast represents the same Roman Empire that John saw before, this is telling us that there will come a revived form of the empire in the world during this last seven-year period of the history of civilization. Many Bible scholars have pointed out that the scriptures predict a restoration, which could be called a revived Roman Empire, that will emerge in Europe in those last days. Again in chapter 17, the angel goes on in verse 9 to explain further that the woman is identified as a great city that sits on seven hills. This is obviously Rome. Once again, we have a clear indication that the city of Rome will come prominently into the picture of these last days. The angel adds some more detail in Revelation 17 verses 10 to 11. He says, These are also seven kings, five of whom have fallen. One is, and the other has not yet come. And when he does come, he must remain only a little while. As for the beast that was and is not, it is an eighth, but it belongs to the seven, and it goes to destruction. There are some effects that we can identify out of these verses. We are told about these seven kings that, five of whom have fallen, one is, and the other has not yet come. The Roman historian Livy, who lived between 64 BC and 17 AD, wrote in his work The History of Rome that, up to his time, there had been five forms of Roman government. Rome originally began as a loosely connected series of regional city-states, each one governed by a king. This soon fell apart and instead of kings, they elected consuls. As the consuls lost their power, they were succeeded by dictators, leaders from the people who would rise up and take over the government. These in turn were overthrown and replaced by what the Romans called decimvirs, a term that means a council of ten leaders. Eventually that form too failed and tribunes were elected by the people to rule the land. Those were the five forms of government that had fallen. John is told about the kings that one is. This would have been the imperial form of government, in other words, the emperors of Rome, beginning with Julius Caesar before Christ and continuing in a long series that stretched well into the 4th century AD. The angel tells John that the seventh king is not yet come, and he must remain only a little while. When the beast appears, he will be one of the seven in a revived form and thus constitute an eighth. Something strange happens to this beast. It is called back into existence and its mortal wound was healed, and thus it makes its reappearance in history. No wonder the whole world will be astonished at this revival. When we come to the 17th chapter of Revelation in due course, we shall learn some very startling things about the emperors of the Roman government. Revelation 17 verses 12 goes on to say, And the ten horns that you saw are ten kings who have not yet received royal power, but they are to receive authority as kings for one hour, together with the beast. Bible scholars sometimes talk about a revived Roman Empire to be made up of ten nations who will give their authority over to a single individual. This satanic-controlled man will rule in the geographic area of the old Roman Empire. Ten years ago, many Christians thought that the European Economic Community, or EEC, or the European Union, as it is now known, was the beast because it did have ten members, but it increased to twelve members and is now down to 11, with the United Kingdom leaving the EEC in January 2020. So the EEC is not the actual revived empire, but it might be a forerunner. There will definitely be a coalition of nations in Europe in the last days. Let us now return to Revelation chapter 13 and look at the activities of the strange beast in Revelation 13 verses 5 to 6. And the beast was given a mouth uttering haughty and blasphemous words, and it was allowed to exercise authority for forty-two months. It opened its mouth to utter blasphemies against God, blaspheming his name and his dwelling, that is, those who dwell in heaven. By the way, the correct term that is translated as those who dwell in heaven is actually those who tabernacle in heaven. It is important to understand that blasphemy is not cursing or using God's name as a swear word. 
Blasphemy is to claim godlike powers or to claim to be God or to identify God with lesser persons or objects. Idolatry, for instance, is blasphemy, identifying God with objects like statues or symbols. That is what this individual becomes guilty of. He blasphemes God by claiming to have the powers of God, as we have seen. This would also involve an attack upon those who do not accept his claims. He ridicules and slanders those who do believe in God and in heaven, which is the unseen spiritual realm that exists, and those people whose thinking is centered on and guided by the teaching of the word of God. This is where the incorrect translation of verse 6 as those who dwell in heaven becomes problematic. Those who tabernacle in heaven are not people who have died and gone to heaven. They are believers who live on the earth but whose lives are governed by the heavenly reality. This is exactly what Paul says about the church today in Philippians chapter 2, verses 20. This verse says, But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. All believers are really strangers and wanderers on earth, because our true citizenship is in heaven. Revelation 13, verses 7 to 8 says the beast was allowed to make war on the saints and to conquer them. And authority was given it over every tribe and people and language and nation, and all who dwell on earth will worship it, everyone whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who was slain. This revived Roman leader is given great power. He is allowed to do dreadful things, and thousands will die at his hand because of their faith. This links us with what we saw in chapter 7, where a great multitude which no man could number comes out of the tribulation, from all nations and languages and tribes and peoples. This is a group that washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. This can be found in Revelation 7 verses 14. This multitude will become martyrs for the sake of Jesus Christ. This is the same group that is mentioned here in Revelation 13 verses 7 to 8. This leader's influence extends throughout the whole earth, but it does not mean that he actually rules over the whole earth, but rather that his influence extends throughout it, very much like the superpowers like the USA, China and Russia do today. There will be one type of people who will follow this leader blindly. They are called those who dwell on earth. We have seen this term before. It describes a type of person who lives for this world only, who are materialists and humanists, and who have no use for the things of God or the life beyond. There is one group that resists this leader, and that group are those who tabernacle in heaven, whose names are written, we are told here, before the foundation of the world in the book of the life of the Lamb who was slain. This shows us again how time is not a factor in eternity. The death of the Lamb actually took place in time on earth at a specific date on the calendar. But here it is reckoned as an eternal event which has meaning for peoples from the very beginning of time, the creation of the world itself. The Lamb was slain and the cross has impact upon all creation. So the Old Testament saints could be born again by faith because they were saved by the cross even though it had not yet occurred in time or history. Finally, John now picks up on the phrase that Jesus uses frequently and gives a word of encouragement to the saints of the day in Revelation 13 verses 9. He says, If anyone has an ear, let him hear. Now Jesus said this many times in his ministry, also in chapters 2 and 3 of Revelation, to the seven letters to the churches. So by using this exhortation, Jesus is saying, Listen carefully, I am about to say something important. Unfortunately, I am going to have to leave this podcast and study in mid-air, with us all wondering what John wanted us to see and hear and understand. So it will have to wait until the next time we get together for the Journey Through the Scriptures podcast. But for now, I will leave you all with this final thought. True believers have been redeemed not with perishable things like silver and gold, but with the precious blood of the spotless Lamb of God, the blood of Jesus Christ. God the Father will not look at the work of Christ and cancel it. That is why it is impossible for true believers to be ultimately deceived and lost. God has written down all the names of all true believers in the book of life 
and he did it before the foundation of the world. At the appointed time, God's only begotten Son came and fulfilled his purpose in purchasing the eternal salvation of all believers, which cannot be altered. So this Antichrist, no matter what he does, will not triumph over believers. He will not triumph over those who belong to Christ, for whom Christ has died and purchased an eternal redemption. This is David Wiles, your fellow traveler in Christ, and this has been the Journey Through the Scriptures podcast, episode 43.